Uh, so today we have the pleasure of having the second lecture by Professor Mario Campanelli. Um, I think I will uh, let him uh, start and I hope that this uh, somehow will uh, provoke more connections. There are only 11 connected so far, but I guess the, the other people will, will come in. They, they are starting to do so. So Mario, it's yours. Okay, do you hear me now? Do you see the screen? Yes. Yeah, very good. So I can start. So uh, today I'm going to discuss a topic which is uh, Mm, not super common, uh, but very uh, readily new, and uh, like, which is growing very fast in particle physics, which is the so-called hidden sector and long-lived particles. Uh, so um, something that uh, deals with searching for new physics, uh, searching new, for new physics uh, in uh, interesting uh, corners of the phase space, where so far very few measurements have been made. Excuse, excuse uh, so, me, Mario. Uh, can can uh, you please try full uh, screen? Sorry. Can you please try to put your slide in full screen? In full screen. Let's see. Okay. View. Not the full screen. Is it better now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, so, uh, uh, since I guess most of you have followed my previous lecture, uh, and know uh, anyway something about particle physics, uh, uh, the standard model of particle physics so far has been king in the sense that uh, is a very, very That's successful the, theory. The, and, uh, the standard model of particles mm -hmm. have been discovered so yeah. far, apart from the <laughs> how. Hello? Um, excuse me, uh, someone who's not uh, except Mario should mute. Everyone except Mario. Should mute. Okay, all right, it's only me. Okay, so I was saying that all the standard model particles have been discovered so far apart from the anti-tau neutrino, the tau anti-neutrino, but there are absolutely no doubt that this particle exists, simply that it's quite, uh, it's quite small cross-section, it's quite difficult to, to produce. And um, yeah, there have been some anomalies, especially in the flavor uh, sector over the last few years, but it's probably fair to say that there is no compelling evidence for new physics uh, uh, so far. Um, the Higgs has been discovered, that's the last particle that was uh, uh, missing from the uh, last piece of the puzzle in the standard model. And uh, the Higgs mass is actually something quite interesting because uh, um, you can connect the Higgs mass and the top mass uh, and in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, the how stable or how unstable is the, uh, the standard model is, how stable and how unstable our universe in a way is. And it is located, uh, as you see, the, the, the current value of the Higgs mass, it is located uh, in a, a region which is uh, uh, pointing towards a metastable universe, uh, but uh, an universe that has a, uh, can remain the current status for an enormous amount of time. So we should not worry about the universe uh, flipping to a, an unstable state uh, anytime soon. Uh, so the uh, standard model could be valid to the Planck scale, given this, uh, uh, these considerations. Um, you know, for a long time there's been discussion about naturalness. Um, what is naturalness? I, uh, I have a slide dedicated to it uh, now, but uh, uh, basically naturalness was an argument that uh, for a long time has been um, carried on to uh, invoke some new physics beyond the uh, standard model, and the argument goes like, uh, like that. Uh, the fact is that the Higgs mass is the sum of two terms. One is the bare mass, the true mass of the Higgs. One is the uh, mass that comes from radiative correction, from quantum corrections. <coughs> this is true for all the particles, actually. Uh, so all particles, uh, uh, the mass of all particles are the contribution of uh, 
severe part plus an additional radiative correction part. The point is that for the Higgs, this radiative correction part can be uh, very large because they are uh, proportional, as you see to the right side here, um, then you, you have a term that nobody really uh, knows, but we assume it can be of the order one, uh, plus a lambda of new physics squared, so the scale of new physics. That means that if you assume that there are <coughs> new uh, particles uh, at a scale, for instance, the Planck scale, this second term can be extremely large. Uh, so that means that if you want to have a Higgs mass uh, quite small, because the Higgs mass compared to the Planck scale is rather small, that means that you need to have that the bare mass is very, very close to this uh, additional term. And so this is something that people don't like, because it looks like there is really a fine tuning between two parameters uh, of nature that should not really be so close to each other because I mean this term would, could be negative so the idea is that in order to have a small Higgs mass you have the bare mass could be very large this term could be very large and negative and they should almost exactly cancel each other and this of course uh, is something which is considered to be very unnatural and uh, um, and uh, and therefore people thought at uh, possible solutions for that and supersymmetry, which is a very popular, or it was a very popular theory, is, is still quite popular anyway, is that uh, really solves this problem. Because supersymmetry uh, postulates that for each uh, fermion in this kind of loops, there is also corresponding uh, boson, and for each boson, there is a corresponding fermion with a minus sign. And if the masses, all the fermions and all the supersymmetric bosons, or all the bosons and the supersymmetric fermions are close to each other, then they will um, uh, mainly cancel, this, this divergence will, will cancel, and therefore the Higgs mass can be a finite body. However, this is uh, uh, a problem, this fine tuning is a problem only if you consider that there are other particles. The standard model uh, is not uh, the end of the world, this we know, but you consider that there are other particles with large masses. Uh, however, so far, uh, as I said, no uh, particles, no, no supersymmetric particles have been found, neither particle from other theories beyond the standard model have been found. So apart from this, there are many other things we don't understand. We should perhaps also focus on this. So we don't understand the baryon asymmetry of the universe. Uh, so with, with, with this term, we mean that we have much more matter than antimatter. This is something that we we know from our daily experience the fact that you know um, first of all our uh, we are made of matter our planet our solar system are made of matter our if matter meets meets antimatter the two will annihilate will uh, explode but um, we don't see any uh, explosion in our everyday life where matter meets antimatter also if we look at the sky we haven't uh, we don't see these these explosions and also. Um, group of physicists uh, uh, based uh, at CERN and in, in the US um, and in, uh, in Asia. They built a, a detector called AMS. This detector has been orbiting around the Earth for nine years to search. Uh, it's still there, by the way, on the International Space Station. And this detector is searching for extragalactic antimatter and hasn't found compelling evidence for that. So uh, we have, apparently, in our universe much more matter than antimatter. Uh, this can be explained um, by CP violation, namely the fact that the laws of physics are different between matter and antimatter. But the CP violation has been discovered in quarks uh, in the quark sector in the 60s. But this is definitely not sufficient to explain our universe. We need a mechanism to have additional CP violation. We know that neutrinos oscillate, so we could have a CP violation in the neutrino sector. But there must be a mechanism. To translate this um, possible uh, difference between matter and antimatter in the neutrino sector into baryogenesis, into the production of baryons rather than antibaryons. Then there is a the problem of dark matter. Uh, so uh, there are many astrophysical indicators. Uh, the most famous is the rotational uh, radial rotational speed of galaxies that point to the fact that the universe is much heavier than uh, the mass that we see. Uh, this uh, this dark matter cannot be too light because 
uh, some years ago it was quite popular to think that perhaps neutrinos could constitute the dark matter, but neutrinos are way too light and therefore too quick, uh, too fast between them. And if this dark matter is made of very light particles, this, this would have influence as such a formation of the universe. The universe would be much more homogeneous. So the fact that we see large homo the universe is, is largely non-homogeneous. Well, this fact points to the fact that the, uh, the dark matter should be relatively heavy and not very much interacting. So that uh, this is what we call do cold dark matter because it's uh, uh, not moving very fast. And therefore, we are searching for uh, dark matter particles, uh, but so far we haven't found any evidence for uh, dark matter, uh, any compelling evidence of dark matter in our experiments. Then there are other things that we don't understand. Uh, for instance, is the pattern of masses and mixing. So uh, you see to the uh, right have the masses of the known uh, particles. Uh, so well, uh, the neutrinos are very light. Uh, so for, for the neutrinos, we don't uh, we know the mass differences, but we don't even really know the absolute masses of the neutrinos because they are so light, it's so difficult to measure. Then we have a region between uh, say half and MeV, where is the, uh, the mass of the electron and a bit more than that where there is the mass of the up and down quarks, even if defining the mass of these light quarks is theoretically not very, not very clear. And then we have a region of the other quarks. Uh, the top stands up out because it's very heavy, it's under 75 uh, GV. The uh, W and Z bosons are at a so-called electroweak scale, so we're talking about 100 GV. The Higgs boson is also uh, in, not shown here, but it's also at the scale. And then this is very far away from the uh, Planck scale. Why there are these differences? Nobody really understands. These are the masses. There's another uh, the set of parameters of the standard model that we don't understand, uh, and it's the mixing. So you uh, probably know that in weak interactions, uh, the, um, the quarks are mixing because the, uh, it's not the quark in itself, it's not that interacts via weak interactions, but it's a combination, it's a quantum overlap of quarks that interacts. Now, in the uh, case of quarks, uh, however, the mixing matrix between the various uh, uh, quark families is quite diagonal. So um, while uh, so the, the mixing between one, the first and the second family is quite small, you can see it from shown by these uh, squares, that is uh, blue and green squares, the mixing between the, the first and the third family is much smaller than that. So you see, this is the size of these uh, squares there. So, uh, so actually this is between the second and third, and the one the, between the first and the third is even smaller. It's this tiny square that you see here. So overall means that between the quarks, the quarks don't mix very much between the various families. I said that neutrinos oscillate. So neutrinos uh, oscillate through a similar matrix that has been called the PMNS uh, matrix. On the other hand, the pattern of mixing between the neutrinos, so the, the mixing between the, uh, the neutrino um, mass eigenstates and neutrino flavors eigenstates, as you see here, well, it is completely different. So here, the, uh, say, the, the mixing between families uh, is very large. And we don't understand why. We don't understand why the, the, the mixing looks completely different between um, neutrinos and quarks. And we don't understand any of these numbers. So we don't know why the mixing should be like this, like as it is, and why it's so different between uh, the uh, quarks and the electrons. So this is clearly some open question. You may think we, we don't care because after all, well, we don't understand that we don't understand, but clearly we would we'll like to have models that also predict masses and mixing. And there are models, but uh, uh, of course, they're awaiting some confirmation by discovering uh, other particles. Then there is uh, inflation, something we don't really understand very uh, well, because it looks like the universe uh, in the very first uh, moments of its existence had a very rapid expansion. And this is uh, compatible with uh, all the cosmological observations. However, uh, it's very strange the parameters governing this inflation are really not very understood as well. Also, the other thing is that uh, there have been searches, of course, the LHC has been running for about 10 years now, and uh, uh, people looked for new physics for uh, all these 10 years, 
um, the uh, so far there are limits only, and these limits, the masses of new particles, are pushed forward towards the TeV scale. Uh, the four again uh, this argument of the um, naturalness of the fact that uh, possible supersymmetry theory uh, protects the Higgs mass uh, uh, stars to get weaker because this only works if the masses of supersymmetric particles are uh, comparable to the mass of the other particles. So here I have a, a table showing the limits that we have put uh, on uh, uh, supersymmetric particles and you see that depending on the model, depending on the mixing that you assume, these this limits vary but we are all the order 1 TV at least, and for some cases, even the order 2 TV. So that means that uh, the phase space for supersymmetric particles in the electroweak uh, uh, range is really uh, very limited or non existent. Uh, and then, of course, there are many other theories uh, for physics beyond the standard model. Um, these theories, uh, there are many, many kinds of theories. They can um, be based on uh, um, additional uh, gauge symmetries. They can be based on assuming that there are uh, heavier um, Ws and Z bosons that are excited quirks, or there are there's a fourth family, uh, and many, many, many other models. Uh, well, anyway, also all these models have limits, uh, which are on the order of the TV or often even more than that. Uh, now there are. Um, as I said, uh, it's not only the mass that matters, but uh, uh, we could think about new ideas, new theories, new places to search for new physics. Uh, and I will describe that in the next slides. But uh, um, this slide, I, I also wanted to um, point your attention to the plot to the right that is not only showing mass limits on the searches, but also lifetime limits. That means that uh, people started to search not only for particles with uh, large mass, but also particles with long lifetime, so a relatively long lifetime, of course. Now, particles that could be produced in the uh, collision points and then travel undetected for several uh, centimeters or even meters, uh, and then uh, at some point uh, uh, appear again and, and then um, decay again into something visible. So, uh, people starting not only to put limits on masses of new physics, but also on the uh, coupling, therefore, on the lifetime of, of these particles. And of course, uh, if you look at the typical limits that you uh, have here, uh, well, the typical limits are of the order of between few centimeters and 10 meters. Uh, and that's because this is the size of the LHC detectors. It means that we cannot, of course, probe a particle that uh, has a, a invisible and would be only visible after two kilometers because after two kilometers we don't have detector anymore. So in a way we are limited to the size of our LHC detectors which is all the order of, uh, of 10 meters in radius. Right, now um, as I said there could be a different approach, there could be a different point of view with respect to new physics. So uh, the conventional approach is to think that new particles have not been found yet because they are too heavy. Therefore, we need a uh, high uh, energy machine, like the LHC, of course, uh, and they run it uh, at also high luminosity to collect more and more high uh, effective energy events, and, uh, uh, and then try to go as high as possible in mass. That's, of course, one approach that has been followed up to now. A different approach is to think that perhaps new particles have not been found yet uh, because their coupling is very small or even new with the other particles. So the production is super rare. So maybe they're light, maybe the, the mass is the other 1 GV, 2 GV, but their uh, coupling is very small, so the production is very uh, unlikely, very rare. So uh, the idea behind that uh, is that the overall uh, theory of the universe, if you want the Lagrangian of the world of the universe, uh, is the sum between the Lagrangian of the standard model that we, we know, and uh, we have started so far with old particle physics experiments, plus a Lagrangian of a hidden sector. So uh, a Lagrangian for particles that we cannot observe um, with a weak coupling to the standard model. So uh, we have sort of a mediation and messenger interaction 
between the visible sector, which are the particles that we know, and this hidden sector, which is made of particles that somehow we cannot know, we cannot observe. And of course, this messenger interaction has is the only way we can get a glimpse about the existence of this uh, uh, hidden sector. Okay, so this uh, uh, sounds less crazy than, than what you may think, because uh, after all, it could solve a lot of problems. Uh, this hidden sector particles could uh, clearly uh, a wonderful candidate for, for dark matter, and uh, they would have no natural issues because these hidden sector particles would have masses similar to the particles that we know. Uh, therefore, the Higgs mass does not have very strong uh, additional uh, term due to the quantum corrections. Uh, okay, so uh, the point is that, of course, this uh, uh, coupling between the hidden sector and the visible sector and the standard model is small. Therefore, uh, there is a small probability of producing the hidden sector particles and the small probability of uh, producing, again, standard model particles from the hidden sector particles. So, again, I mean, how do you detect a hidden particle? Because this is a particle that does not uh, show up, that you can, is not interacting with your detectors, with your instruments. Um, therefore, what, the only thing you can uh, detect uh, is an ordinary particle, being it a standard model particle or maybe a charged supersymmetric particle that is acting as a mediator with the hidden sector Lagrangian. So the experimental signature would be that you produce here a standard model particle. This standard model particle would travel for some time and then uh, would produce a hidden sector particle through this coupling, which is supposed to be small, so the probability of producing the hidden sector particle is small. The hidden sector particle is invisible and will travel some time in your uh, detector. And then at some point, it will um, again convert into another standard model particle. And this is what you observe. In a way, it's a phenomenon analogous to neutrino oscillations, but it's not really an oscillation. Is a coupling between the standard model and the hidden sector that happens twice. The first time you produce the hidden sector particle, the second part, time you produce another standard model particle starting from the hidden sector particle. But of course, this length, this duration can be very long. So uh, the, um, then the, 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 this interaction, the particle, the standard model particles that are coupled with the uh, um, with, uh, hidden sector particles are called portals. So portals is a way, is a door, is a door that allow us to look to the hidden sector, even if not directly, we don't cannot see directly is hidden sector particles, but we can see uh, the portal, we can see the particle that couples to them. So for instance, we can think about the uh, vector portal for a massless uh, particle like the photon, so there is that there's a photon here that can have this interaction with the coupling epsilon that of course epsilon is supposed to be small with a hidden sector particle that in the, that case will be called uh, the dark uh, the dark photon or the hidden photon. Or uh, again, you can have a Higgs portal. You have the standard Higgs particle that can convert into the hidden Higgs, and the other way around, of course, the hidden Higgs could convert back into the Higgs particle. Right, and then there is another uh, another sector of possible hidden particle, which uh, in the neutrino sector. This is actually very important, uh, even if it's not exactly the same thing as uh, as before. But the phenomenology is very very similar. So um, you know the neutrinos oscillate, right? And uh, if neutrinos oscillate, that means that neutrinos have a mass. In the standard formulation of the standard model, in that the the, the initial formulation of the standard model before neutrino oscillations were discovered, uh, neutrinos didn't have a mass and only had a, a right-handed term. So a term that, sorry, left-handed term, a term that couples with strong, uh, weak interactions through a left-handed uh, interaction, a left-handed uh, uh, coupling. Uh, now we know that neutrinos oscillate, the four neutrinos have a mass, the four neutrinos also have a right-handed uh, coupling, right-handed neutrinos. 
On the other hand, we know that weak interactions uh, only couple with uh, right with the left-handed uh, particles. So a uh, fully left-handed uh, neutrinos would fully couple with weak interactions. A fully uh, right-handed neutrino would be completely decoupled, would be invisible, would be sterile. Sterile cannot interact with anything. So the right-handed neutrinos must exist because neutrinos have a mass, because neutrinos oscillate. However, a purely right-handed neutrinos would be invisible because it cannot interact uh, via the electromagnetic interaction because it's neutral. It could not interact via the strong interaction because it's a fermion. It could not interact with the weak interaction because it's right-handed. So, the, um, of course, we don't expect the real neutrinos to be fully uh, left-handed or fully right-handed. We expect the real neutrinos to be a mixture between left-handed and right-handed neutrinos. This is the so-called CSO mechanism. And for uh, the real neutrinos would be a combination, the, the neutrinos we observe would be a combination of left-handed and right-handed. However, the combination is such that our current neutrinos uh, are mainly left-handed, are almost completely left-handed, and the right-handed neutrinos are quite decoupled from that. So this mechanism also can explain why neutrino masses are um, very small, because the, uh, the neutrino mass, the mass of the neutrinos we observe, would be a combination, uh, would be the eigenvalue uh, of a matrix that contains the mass, the real masses of right-handed and left-handed neutrinos, and therefore you could have uh, two uh, real neutrinos, one with mass which is very high and one with mass which is very low. So the, traditionally, through the CISO mechanism, people started to think that, well, okay, right-handed neutrinos exist, but they're very heavy and therefore invisible, it, they, they don't interact, they will never be produced, it's not our problem, we will never be able to detect them. And that explains the fact that neutrino masses are so small. However, this is not all the only possibility. So this Tito mechanism, as I said, is a possible explanation for no small neutrino masses, uh, because the mass of the, the real neutrinos, the masses of neutrinos we observe, would be the uh, ratio between the mass of the, the Dirac neutrinos uh, uh, and um, the, the mass of the heavy sterile neutrinos. However, uh, there is a different way uh, of looking at this problem. One could think that uh, uh, perhaps the, the mass of the right-handed neutrino and the mass of the sterile neutrino is not so high, is not so uh, large, but the fact that neutrino masses are small is the result of the coupling being small. So the coupling um, the, uh, between the two kinds of neutrinos. Is, if it's very small, uh, then you could have that right-handed neutrino, the sterile neutrino, have masses uh, uh, of the order of 1 GV, for instance. So they are perfectly visible in our current experiments, but the coupling is very small, so they're very rare. The uh, production of these right-handed neutrinos would be very rare. So all that to say that in the neutrino sector uh, is um, you can have a phenomenology which is quite similar to the hidden sector I was talking about before. And the neutrino sector, we know that these right-handed neutrinos must exist because we have oscillations. Therefore, this neutrino, this right, the, the neutrino sector could be uh, really a sort of hidden sector inside the standard model. You don't need to change the standard model very much to have this uh, right-handed neutrinos. And uh, if you have a careful choice of parameters, uh, you can have this right-handed neutrinos to explain a lot of open questions in particle physics. So this is the so-called minimal neutrino standard model, which is a theory that is not so recent anymore. It was developed about 15 years ago, uh, mainly by uh, Shabarshnikov, and uh, the idea is that uh, we just complete the standard model with uh, right-handed neutrinos that must be there because of oscillations. So this is the, the on the light, uh, on the left -hand side, we have the standard model as it was originally written in the 60s, uh, where neutrinos are purely left-handed particles. Uh, on the right-handed side, we have 
the standard model as it should be because neutrinos also have a right-handed component. So the neutrinos should be a combination between the left-handed component, that the component that contributes to weak interactions, and the right-handed uh, sterile component. Now, um, so the particle content of the standard model is now made symmetric because we don't have these gaps anymore in the neutrino sectors. We also have right-handed neutrinos by three HNL, HNL means heavy neutral leptons, which are basically right-handed heavy neutrinos that we call N1, N2, and N3. So the model uh, is very smart because uh, basically just making a trivial addition to the standard model and the trivial addition that we know must exist because we know neutrinos oscillate could solve a lot of uh, um, open problems of particle physics. Uh, here, there is the, the presentation had a problem, but the idea is that if N of N1, so the mass of the first right-handed neutrinos, of the order of few KV, KV, so a bit more than the electron mass, but not much more, that could be a good dark matter candidate, uh, or it can generate uh, dark matter uh, quite easily with this uh, kind of particle. Uh, with N of N2 and N3, so the masses of the uh, right-handed neutrinos that correspond to the mu neutrino and the tau neutrinos of the order of few GV that could explain the baryon asymmetry of the universe via leptogenesis and also generate neutrino masses through the seesaw mechanism. So this is a model which is uh, quite popular because as I said, uh, with a minimal addition to the uh, standard model, it could solve several open questions in, this, in, the, uh, in particle physics. So in this case, uh, well, this is just a summary of what I uh, said before. These are, again, is a, a table showing the, um, showing the, 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 the mass hierarchy of the, various, uh, of the various particles. And then we have neutrinos are much lighter than the usual particles, electron muons and tiles and the quarks, but we could have that is uh, right-handed uh, uh, neutrinos to have uh, similar uh, masses as, say, the electron, the muons, and so on. And they could explain dark matter and the barrier image of this uh, universe and neutrino oscillation. So that's quite appealing. Now, how could you produce this heavy neutral leptons? You could, uh, could produce them from neutrinos. And uh, if you want to produce the uh, second and third generation, which are the ones that maybe are supposed to have more um, coupling uh, with the standard model, uh, well, you need to start with the mu neutrino. How to get mu neutrinos? We can get them from a decay of uh, uh, particles with, uh, uh, like the DS, which is a particle with charm quarks, that will decay into a muon and uh, a mu neutrino. Now, uh, the interaction of this mu neutrino with the Higgs field can convert the mu neutrino into a second or third generation heavy neutral left. Um, people have searched for these things. So, um, the, the, so far, there are no dedicated experiments uh, for this kind of physics, but people have searched for this thing using fixed target experiments at FPS or using LHCB, which is one of the uh, LHC experiments, of course. And this uh, allowed to set limits to some of the parameters. Uh, all of this uh, right-handed neutrinos. Then how would you observe it? Well, you observe it in a similar way as you produced. So if you go back here, you produce these particles uh, having a, a mu neutrino interacting with the Higgs field. And uh, when this uh, heavy neutral lepton interacts again with the Higgs field, it will convert again into a mu neutrino. Now, if the new mu neutrino is virtual and is low energy, it will uh, produce a pion and a muon. So you would observe in your detector a pion and a muon uh, coming from the uh, muon neutrino. Uh, that is the result of the um, heavy neutral electron interacting with the Higgs field. Okay, so uh, of course, all this, uh, the probabilities of these interactions, of these decays uh, are model dependent, but the message to take home is that, uh, yes, you can produce in a lab these heavy neutral leptons, as you can produce like a hidden photon, as you can produce a hidden Higgs, uh, you cannot see them directly, but you see them once these particles convert back 
into a standard model particle that you can observe with your detector. So there are several constraints. I'm not going into the details of that, but uh, uh, there are constraints uh, due to cosmology, due to observations, uh, and so on. So there are, um, if you want to explain dark matter, uh, well, this, uh, the mass of this object uh, and interaction strength should be connected by uh, the fact that it should be higher than this line. If you, um, if you consider that the, the, the dark matter is uh, not too large, then you have an additional limit, then you have additional limits from cosmological observation. So there are limits on the existence of these particles, but they do leave still quite a large uh, range for the existence of these particles. And all these limits are basically coming from astrophysics. Uh, there are very few limits coming from particle physics uh, searches. Then uh, there are additional um, constraints on the masses of the second and third generation heavy neutral leptons coming from the burial symmetry of the universe and the CISO mechanism. Again, mainly astrophysical considerations. Right. Now, can we look for these particles at LHC? Yes. And we have done that. We have done that uh, in uh, um, Atlas, for instance, but also in, in CMS. And uh, um, so, in Atlas, uh, well, the, there was an analysis that, which also um, contributed, uh, that aimed at uh, looking for these uh, uh, particles with a displaced vertex. What does it mean? So uh, let's consider, let's start from, from the left-hand side, uh, and we produce a, a W boson, you know, a W boson can be produced uh, in relatively often in the, in the LHC, then this W boson normally decays into a charged lepton, like an electron or a muon, and a neutrino. This is very standard that we have a lot, a lot of W bosons that have been measured so far. Now, these neutrinos could interact with uh, the Higgs field and convert into one of these heavy neutral leptons. This heavy neutral lepton can travel as much as it wants. Uh, and then at some point, again, interacting with the Higgs field, it will produce a neutrino, and then the neutrinos will undergo the opposite uh, reaction as its production. The four will produce a W and a lepton, and a charged lepton. Now, the W will immediately disintegrate into, again, a charged lepton and neutrino. So what do you observe in this uh, uh, kind of uh, um, events? Well, you observe three leptons, one here coming from the the decay of the first W, one here coming from the neutrino, and one there coming from the decay of the second W. Now the charge of these uh, um, leptons is different, so the charge of this and of that are the same, the charge of this and of that are opposite, but these two leptons are coming from a displaced vertex. They are coming, they're not coming from the uh, center of the detector, but they're coming from several centimeters away, or even meters, if you could measure that. Okay, that's the idea. You look for something where the, uh, this invisible particle has traveled in our detector for long amount of space, and then produces a secondary vertex, a displaced vertex. So uh, clearly we have background. The backgrounds are different kinds, of course, we have background from uh, three lepton uh, cases. We have background from combinatorics, from random tracks with, that we don't reconstruct very well. But this is how it would look like, right? A displaced vertex would look like. You have, uh, for a long time, you have an empty detector, and then all of a sudden you see two tracks. And also, on top of that, we have an additional lepton, an additional a uh, muon in this case, coming from the decay of the uh, first W. So all these uh, uh, backgrounds have been estimated, and uh, it was found out that, okay, that our, uh, what we observe is compatible with the background, so we don't have an indication of these long lived particles uh, from, this, uh, uh, from this measurement, and as I, uh, usually happens, then we could put limits. Uh, to be honest, uh, to be, um, here, this, this measurement uh, was the sum of two analyses. One analysis that was looking at uh, displaced vertices, so it was looking at this kind of topology, and one analysis that was looking uh, for three, uh, what is called the prompt case, 
where uh, the uh, three uh, leptons or the three muons are all coming from the interaction point uh, because of the, the, the assumption there is that this, the coupling of these right-handed neutrinos was strong enough to, uh, to, predict, to immediately uh, produce a neutrino, therefore that is the displaced vertex would not be so displaced. So this, uh, this limit is the sum of these two contributions. So this band here represents the search for the prompt case where the three leptons are all starting from the same place. And you see that it is, uh, has quite a large range in terms of masses, but it cannot put limits, to, put too strong limits to, um, to the couplings. On the other hand, the displaced vertex case is limited to a smaller mass range, but it can put limits to much smaller uh, couplings because uh, it can uh, search for the cases where uh, these heavy neutral leptons has traveled uh, quite a lot in your detector. So, okay, this is the prospect for sensitivity. One could, uh, in the LHC run tree or even high luminosity, could cover a much larger region of phase space uh, than the, uh, the current measurements, which are right here. But nevertheless, still a large region of phase space would remain uncovered uh, doing searches with the LHC. In the LHC, in the standard detectors like Atlas or CMS, we are not only searching for these uh, right-handed neutrinos, but we are searching for a lot of displaced uh, signatures that are predicted by several theories. So we are uh, searching for cases like displaced jets, where you have a jet that instead of starting from the uh, center of the detector, starts somewhere in the track or even the calorimeter, uh, disappearing tracks, displaced photons, and so on and so forth. So a lot, a lot of strange signatures, something that you, uh, you were not really uh, searching for initially, but uh, that with, uh, with time, with not having found uh, signals for more standard signatures, uh, well, with time, this signature became more important, and there are a lot of people now searching for these exotic and strange uh, signatures. And not only the agent sector, not only the uh, model from Shabushnikov uh, are predicting the existence of long-lived particles, many theories beyond the standard model predict the existence of these uh, long-lived feeble interacting particles. So even supersymmetry in several um, flavors of supersymmetry uh, does predict that. The several generic dark matter models, more exotic models called squirks, stable sexta quarks, and so on predict that. So basically when you're searching for these lonely particles, we are making a, a model independent search and then if you found something, well we'll be very happy. On the other hand, it's even possible that we don't know what we have found because we have several models predicting uh, the existence of this particle. So as I said, the uh, experimental signatures can be very different. They could either be like normal particles starting from the center or they could be disappearing tracks, a, a particle that at some point, a uh, normal standard model particle that at some point produces a hidden sector particle that disappears, and the low energy particle that occurs in the detector. The, the model I've just the, described, where you have displaced vertex, uh, the one of the Atlas analysis that is, I um, explained, displaced jets, and so on. Of course, the LHC detectors were not built for this. The LHC detectors were not built to search for this kind of particles. Um, so these are very unusual signatures and they present a lot of challenges in triggering. So we have to reconstruct this. Uh, uh, we, we have to understand in real time that these events are indeed interesting and therefore we would like to uh, store them, to record them. Uh, tracking, of course, uh, reconstructing a track that does not come from the primary vertex is more difficult because there are fewer hits and there are fewer constraints. The calibration is a nightmare because the calibration is done for particles that are well behaved and don't disappear uh, or don't get created in the middle of the calorimeter. And then of course the backgrounds have to be determined from data uh, because we are looking at strange regional phase space. There is no simulation that can describe them accurately. So there are several models uh, that uh, people uh, search for, uh, and so far we haven't found anything uh, either, but uh, there are several limits that have been placed on the existence of displaced jets, 
displays, lacterns, disappearing tracks, uh, stuff particles, any kind of thing. So there are a lot, a lot, there's a lot of activity going on in searching for these long-lived and disappearing particles. However, as I said, the Lichty experiments were not built for that. So people started to think that perhaps one could build some dedicated experiments uh, or some additions to the current experiments that would allow us to um, better search for this uh, hidden sector uh, particle, those weakly interacting long-lived particles. So I will um, surely discuss the, these last two proposals, uh, Matuslas and Phaser, uh, because the Phaser has actually been approved, Matuzla hasn't been approved, but it's quite a large experiment with an interesting collaboration behind. So the idea of uh, Matuzla is that you have Atlas or CMS, they are down in the cavern at the depth of about 100 meters, and then you build a large detector on the surface. So this lar large detector would be able to observe these long-lived particles that travel 100 meters or more, because they, they would go diagonally, and they would interact in the detector. So this would allow extending the range of searches from a few meters, and we have now, uh, given the size of other CMS, to 100 meters or even more, because then you have this detector, which is located quite far away from the interaction point. Uh, and then people are thinking of quite large detector, like the other 200 uh, square meters, well, 200 meters squared, so even more than 200 square meters uh, of detector. Therefore, that could, uh, that could aim at uh, probing uh, quite small couplings. Um, this can be, uh, on the other hand, this is quite a big detector. You really need a very large detector because uh, the flux is quite small because you're far away from the production of these particles. A completely different approach, still at LHC, is phaser. Phaser uh, is a detector that, on the other hand, uh, will be located in the, um, in the LHC tunnel. Uh, actually, not really in the LHC tunnel, but just in a service tunnel, which is very close to LHC tunnel, um, basically in line with the uh, particles. With, with, a, with a beam, but the beam then will bend. The accelerator, of course, is a circle. So um, phaser would be on the line of the beam, on the beam axis. So uh, the idea is that if you produce a long-lived particles here, and this long-lived particles goes along the beam pipe, uh, it is possible that phaser will be able to see it. The phaser is uh, uh, approved to take data in run three. They are moving very fast. They are built a prototype that uh, has shown that it can work. Um, it can look for dark photons, dark Higgs, heavy neutral leptons, and so on. It's a small detector. It's made of a, a silicon track, an electromagnetic calorimeter, or in a magnetic field. Now, these are the uh, searches of this kind of long-lived particles of LHC, but there could be a different approach. Uh, because as I said, these new particles uh, are probably are light and weakly interacting. So the LHC is, of course, has the advantage of very high energies, but it doesn't have a huge intensity. Well, it does have a huge intensity for the, um, for the, um, the energy, but uh, compared to, to lower energy machines, it has smaller intensities. So the best place to look for uh, particles which are light and weakly interacting may not be the LHC, but uh, for instance, the SPS. The SPS is um, an older accelerator of CERN, is an accelerator uh, with a um, radius of seven kilometers and an energy of 450 GeV. Uh, so uh, the idea would be to take the protons from the SPS, stand them against an absorber, a very thick piece of material where you can send an enormous amount of protons. Uh, and then what happens is that there, in the, um, the, product, the, the, the protons from the SPS will interact with the material, will uh, produce mesons that decay, producing neutrinos. And therefore, these neutrinos could convert into a heavy neutral lepton, or you could produce a particle from the dark sector from these interactions. So uh, then you want to have a long decay tunnel between the target and the detector, you won't have like 50 meters, 100 meters, because again, there you want to look for long couplings. Okay, so this is the idea. There's a proposed experiment that's called uh, SHIP at CERN, 
Um, the idea is that uh, this will be a dedicated detector for weakly coupled long lived particles. So the beam from the SPS was, would come from here. Here you have this uh, thick target and the header absorber. Then you have the so called Muir shield, it is a strong magnetic field that deflects the muons. Here you have uh, something that has nothing to do with uh, long lived particles, but it is a neutrino detector because with this detector you can study the properties of neutrinos with very good precision. Then you have a long decay volume, and then uh, finally you have your detector with uh, your chambers, kilometers, and so on. This um, the experiment uh, requires the existence of this uh, beam dump facility, so it requires the existence of all this region where the beam is absorbed and the uh, background muons are deflected. Uh, the aim is to have a zero background experiments. Therefore, if you only see two um, long lived particles that you can claim that you discovered them. Um, the physics reach of this kind of experiments is uh, uh, quite uh, large uh, in terms of uh, possibly covering the phase space for heavy neutron leptons, for dark photons here, for uh, possible uh, scalars, uh, dark scalars, uh, um, light particles uh, and uh, particles that come to photon in general. Uh, so this is a, a possibility, this is an, an example of an experiment that's been produced and uh, proposed. Uh, unfortunately, raised, recently CERN has, well, the whole Europe went through uh, exercise of setting priorities and the beam dump facility has been considered very nice from the physics point of view, but CERN probably doesn't have resources to build it in the next five years or so. So, uh, yeah, this idea is very nice, but you may have to wait some time before it becomes reality. The last topic I wanted to touch in terms of low uh, interacting particle uh, are monopoles. So, you know that, um, you know that in the standard model, we don't, in the classical, even classical magnetism, Right, we don't have single magnetic charges. There are single electric charges, but we don't have magnetic monopoles. Uh, we only have magnetic dipoles. Um, so uh, Dirac has made a, a theory where uh, the uh, um, existence of magnetic monopoles will explain the quantization of the electric charge. So not only it will uh, make the Maxwell equation symmetric. Because the Maxwell equation, if you read them, this term is zero, and we don't have terms that correspond to uh, magnetic currents. Uh, on the other hand, you, if you think that magnetic monopoles exist, well, the Maxwell equation would become symmetric. Uh, you would explain the fact that the electric charge is quantized, and would have these magnetic monopoles with a very large charge. The charge would be multiple of 68.5 times the electric charge. So of course these objects are very uh, charged and it will be readily easy to see. Uh, and all collider detectors have searched for these monopoles and uh, also the, the, the electron, but also the LHC has searched for these monopoles. Unfortunately, also there we don't have um, positive results. Otherwise, all the textbooks would have been rewritten with the Maxwell equations rewritten in this, this form that also account for magnetic monopoles. So the, there is an experiment uh, which has been installed around the collision point of LHCb because Mödel, this experiment has searched for using different techniques uh, for monopoles. Also, there, there are only limits. So we, we don't have any uh, discovery, unfortunately. Uh, but there was also the first experiment that searched for these monopoles at high energy, even at the highest energies for the LHC. And another possibility for monopoles that's quite interesting is that maybe, you know, monopoles are uh, already there, they've been produced, and they are, have been trapped in the beam pipe for the LHC and are still there. So in order to discover them, one should take the beam pipe for the LHC, cut it uh, into small pieces and go through um, uh, magnetometer is, is a very sensitive, sensitive magnetometer and, and I look for um, yeah, magnetic uh, um, single charges. Right, so this is uh, uh, of course 
uh, not possible because they see experiments want to keep them in life, of course. Uh, but it will be possible in the future, the end of the LHC run or whenever the device will have to be changed. Right, so let me go to my conclusions. It's almost one hour that we're talking. Uh, so the search for traditional new physics like SUSE, uh, extended symmetry, sequential excited fermions and so on, did not lead to discoveries so far. So we need to continue this search, but also we need to look elsewhere. Uh, we need to look to strange exotic signatures and many theories predict the existence of these long-lived particles that would be difficult to observe. They are experimentally very challenging, uh, but they open a new dimension and they're also fun to look for because the, you need to change your, the way you're doing the analysis. You have to build, to, to, to have new reconstruction algorithms, new triggering ideas and so on. It is really a new field, new ideas emerge constantly. There are ideas for new experiments, some of them have been approved. So the future is probably uh, quite interesting for this field. And uh, just to show the fact that uh, uh, the physicists of the LHC and not only of the LHC, they uh, can have a lot of fantasies, a lot of new ideas to, to, to search for new physics anywhere it could hide. That's it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mario, for this nice overview of um, um, interesting exotic physics at the LHC with very um, interesting uh, experimental signatures. So let's see if we have questions. I actually cannot see whether people raise their hands. So in the chat, maybe there is one question. Uh, yes, please go ahead, uh, Xala. Hi, uh, thank you for, for the very nice talk. Uh, I have a few questions, but then I'm not sure if I should, like, which one I should ask first. Um, let me just check. So yeah, I want to, this is a very naive question actually. Is how does the coupling <coughs> between two particles translate to a low production or low co cross section? Hello. Hello, Mario. Did you hear the question? I'm muted, Mario. Maybe Steve, you can explain that why we Mario comes back. He maybe has some connection problem. Uh, so, sorry, can, I was can muted. You... Sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I started to talk. And so I was saying that the um, so the production or, or the decay of a particle, uh, of course, can comes from the calculation, comes from the Lagrangian, to be expressed in a visual form uh, using this Feynman diagram, right? And so you have this term, the interaction comes from the term that connect the, mm, the uh, um, uh, to call them, well, it's not the wave function, but it's, it's, a, it's a spinner uh, in, a, in a quantum field theory that connects that to uh, the, the corresponding boson or the corresponding particle that can transfer the force, that can carry the force. So that is, const there is a constant associated to each of these vertices uh, and this constant is the coupling. Now the probability of something happening uh, is proportional to the square of this coupling. So uh, probability of a decay is proportional to the square of the coupling, the probability of an interaction uh, or production of a particle depends on the square of the coupling. So the coupling is small, the probability of that vertex to happen is also small, actually even smaller because it's, it's the square of that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> another question that, I, that, that I, had, I wanted to ask is that you said that the, um, the, 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 the long-lived um, analysis um, is like, was like a, um, a sum, the, the sum of two, um, of two analyses where you first, uh, I'm guessing you first uh, look for, you look for um, <clears throat> decays of the decay of a, um, a W boson into into a neutrino and and then into uh, leptons, 
and then later on, later on you you would find, you you would also look for uh decay of a D, the 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 DK the, the conversion of the of the second generation it was the first generation neutrino into a into a standard model neutrino which would then decay into into yeah it decays into a, uh, a W boson and then um, uh, leptons right so what I wanted to find out is that is how do you trace the two vertices the two the the two DK vertices and 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 see that they belong to the same process. Well, uh, this vertex is really very close, it's basically indistinguishable from the primary vertex of the event, so from the yeah. center of the detector. Okay. Yes. Yes. So here you see a lepton, in this case a muon, which is counting from the center of the detector. Yeah. Then this would uh, be displaced vertex. Therefore, you see two leptons with opposite charges uh, at a distance from the center of the detector. But they belong to the same collision. So they happen during the same proton collision. And of course, they could be coming from pileup. They could be coming from uh, cosmic rays. They could, in fact, there is background to this analysis. However, uh, the background can be estimated. There are several techniques to estimate this background using uh, um, empty bunches, for instance, or, or using uh, uh, overlapping in normal events before we yeah. can estimate uh, quite precisely from data how much is the background uh, of this to this event uh, coming from bad reconstructions and indeed yeah. uh, where was it uh, so you see well you know it was here in the end when you are uh, requesting already two leptons in the displaced vertex uh, the the background is very very small because it's very something very rare it's a very very rare thing that happens to have two ver two uh displaced uh, two uh laptops two muons coming from displaced vertex and at the same time in the same um, collision also have an energetic lepton coming from the decay of w uh, from the center of the detector well so so uh, did, did i hear you right that i even even just looking for 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 um, a, an event where 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 um, uh, where you have where you have uh, two leptons decay um, decaying from it from from away from the center of the, the detector that's very very rare. Yes, it's very rare. Yes, uh, okay. especially two muons, two electrons can be produced from uh, photon conversion. But having two muons is, is very rare. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, this is the last question. So you spoke about uh, this. Uh, it is two proposed um, proposed um, experiments or yeah e extensions to 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 the LHC where you would they would look for um, long lived particles. And you spoke about an experiment that is on the surface. Is this like, yeah? Is it just situated on the surface? I just wanted to find out how they would um, be able to deal with the background that comes from cosmic rays, since the the idea of having an experiment uh, underground was to was to my, was to mitigate the problem of that background. Yeah, in fact, you see that here uh, there are not only the um, the, 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 the possible uh, long-lived particles that you see interacting with this detector, but you have muons coming from the uh, LHC collision point that will definitely be measured by this detector, and also cosmic rays coming from the opposite direction. And then for um, to remove cosmic rays, uh, of course, the, 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 the best way is to have excellent timing. Sorry, excellent timing means that you need to know exactly uh, with very good precision when the um, particle crosses the different layers of the detector, and that will allow you to distinguish particles which are coming from above to particles coming from below. On the other hand, there we are we are uh, looking for displaced vertices. Yeah. Okay. So not. Um, a single track is not enough. You need to have 
vertex with two particles coming out of it. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks. Okay. Um, are there other questions? Yeah, I see a hand that's raised, Steve. Oh, sorry, I, I cannot see that. Uh, who who has raised his hand? Shalini. So, Shalini, please uh, ask your question. Uh, hi, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, I had a quick question related to Zola's. Uh, could you please go back to the slide where you talked about the high mass searches at Atlas? Uh, where you had the W boson decaying to the um, lepton and the displaced vortex. So again, this one. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. So my question is, uh, how much is this displacement expected to be? How much is this in terms of uh, size, length? Oh yeah, the length, roughly the length. So yeah, in this analysis, uh, we still wanted to have uh, the muons uh, at least partly reconstructed in the tracker of Atlas. So we're talking about some centimeters. We are not, we did not go um, into looking for muons which are only detected in the muon spectrometer. So we're talking about a few centimeters. But this analysis could be extended to the case where two, these two muons are coming from the Atlas uh, muon chambers, which are a few meters away from the interaction point. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Other questions? Yes, there is one in the chat. Let me see. Uh, Mohamed, do you have a question? Or was it just a comment? Oh, okay, it was just a comment. Um, yeah, maybe another question. One more from Zola. Very inspired by this talk. Go ahead, please. Hi. Uh, I was just uh, hoping that you could please explain the limit plots, like a bit, a bit, like a bit more in depth. Uh, limit plot? Yeah. Okay, like the like results. So here, uh the limit plot and there are a lot of plots looking like this right uh, um yeah. show on the x-axis the uh, mass the possible mass of this hypothetical particle of this uh, um heavy neutral lepton versus the coupling of this particle um that means that everything uh, um above a given coupling as so all this region here is excluded while all the region below is uh, is uh, uh, still possible because I mean, the experiment, of course, is not perfect. Uh, we only could produce, uh, could uh, analyze a limited amount of data. So the uh, ex observed limit, uh, uh, the experimental limit, uh, is the black line. So this black line is really the millimeter that we have from our measurement, from our experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, while uh, the uh, the green and the, the yellow bands represent uh, uh, the expected limit. It means that um, you could, uh, we have our simulations and the simulation are telling us that if you have our experiment and we are not, uh, we get what you expect from the background, we expect to get a given limit. And it's quite important that our observed limits are not too dissimilar from the expected limits because you can be lucky or unlucky, so you can have a fluctuation in the background that you don't expect your background to fluctuate too much. And if you have a, a, an observed limit, which is very different from the observed limit, there's something strange, either something strange with your analysis or you maybe discovered something. So uh, in this case, we haven't discovered anything because the um, observed limit, which is this black line, sits comfortably inside the green band, which is the one sigma. Uh, expected limit, so it's quite uh, uh, expected. Uh, so this uh, line here is coming from the uh, prompt uh, search. 
So the prompt means where we search for three muons and all of these muons are coming from the main vertex. On the other hand, the displays analysis, the one that I have uh, described, uh, uh, sorry, the one that I've described in here, uh, where you have a distance traveled by this uh, heavy neutral lepton, uh, the displays analysis uh, results in this limit here. This limit here means that all the area inside this uh, dropped shaped uh, uh, contour is excluded. So uh, if you want, it is, the two are complementary because yes, the mm, uh, prompt analysis excludes larger masses, but uh, here we are limited to relatively small masses between say 2 GV and 10 GV, but we uh, can exclude even smaller limits because smaller coupling, sorry, because we can uh, uh, search for cases where the heavy neutral leptons has traveled several centimeters inside the detector. Okay. Um, other questions? So what's the difference between the two plots? Like the one on the left and the one on the right? Like ex except, for, except, for, except for the limits for the for the not prompt decays? Um, so there are, uh, one case is for the uh, coupling to the muons and the other case coming to, to the electrons. Oh. So uh, in one case you have a second generation heavy neutral lepton for the left, and uh, in the case on the right, you have a first generation, something that couples to electrons. As I said, the, um, the displays analysis would only perform with muons because with electrons, you have a background coming from uh, photon conversions. So uh, in this case here, you can look at this uh, process only where this is a muon, this is a muon. Why? Because if this is an electron, this is an electron, you have many cases where there is a photon that interacts with your detector material and produces an electron depositron. Then the background will be too large. So we could not perform the um, displays analysis for the electron case. So the left hand case, the right left hand plot is the muon case. The right hand plot is the electron case, where we only have the prompt analysis, where all the three electrons are coming from the primary vertex. Any more questions? Uh, Mario, I, could you uh, maybe clarify a little bit um, of why the beam dumps are, are needed in the search for this uh, lone leaf? So the case for a beam dump? Yes. All right, so the idea for beam dump is that, uh, so, uh, if the, the particles we are looking for uh, have masses of the order 1 GV, 2 GV or so, it's not really necessary to have all the high energy of the LHC that I remind you, I mean, we have protons of uh, uh, 6.5 TeV. Uh, therefore, it's not really useful to have all these high energy uh, protons, but you may well have protons with energies of the order of 450 GV, uh, but more, but more intensity. So uh, the idea is that you can use a fixed target experiment where you send the protons with a very high intensity against the, an absorber. And then you absorb everything because when you send a proton against the target, you produce a lot of pions, you produce uh, D-mesons, uh, kaons, and so on. Then you put a lot of material there that absorbs all the hadrons, hadron absorbers. Why? Because we are interested in the neutrinos that could come out of this uh, uh, collision. And also, we, there would be muons produced, and the muons uh, are not absorbed by uh, thick material, but the muons can be deflected with a smartly designed uh, muon shield. So the muons are deflected in all directions, therefore the only particles that can really go straight and uh, be measured uh, say 120 uh, meters after the collision, the beam collision, are 
the, either the neutrinos or the long-lived particles that could be produced in this collision. Did you see that, that uh, CERN will not uh, run the ship experiment in the next five years? Yeah, it's not, uh, uh, it's not a high priority on the, on the European strategy. So the high priority is to have, uh, mm, is to have the uh, high lumi LHC, then the research and development for CLIC will continue, and uh, even the idea of having a um, ILC somewhere else is of course not, uh, not excluded, uh, and then also R&D for this uh, large uh, future circular collider continues. So in the end, there are not many resources left to build the Binda facility. So then what will happen to ship? Is that, is well, that if there is no Binda facility, ship cannot be built. This detector requires a Binda facility because you cannot just take you know, the beam from the SPS like a test beam and send it against the target. Uh, you need the material which is very specific that can handle um, high temperatures, high doses of radiation, high intensities and so on. And then you need to build all the muon shield to deflect the muons and the header absorber, possibly a magnetized header absorber. So the ship experiment, which is only this, if you want, uh, requires all this part. CERN has been, and uh, CERN doesn't seem, well, we're waiting for the medium term plan in uh, September, October, but CERN does not seem to have that as a priority. So the collaboration is likely to disband uh, People. Well, we are, uh, I'm part of SHIP, right, myself. So we try to uh, propose alternative small experiments that can be done at the SPS, but clearly it will not be an experiment to look for, uh, for uh, uh, very weakly interacting particles. Because if you want to really uh, put serious limits on weakly interacting particles, you need high intensities. Yeah. Uh, Mario? Uh, what what is approximately the, the estimated cost for this ship experiment? What is the estimate? Can you speak louder? I didn't hear you. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I, I was wondering what would be the the cost of this uh, ship experiment, at least the, the estimated cost. Yeah, most of it is actually the facility because you need to build uh, an extraction line and, uh, uh, and then the target and so on. So that would be of the order 120, under 40 millions, and then the detector itself would cost about 40 millions. I see. So that's why it's important that CERN is on board that uh, to build the extraction line and the beam that facility. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you. The facility that's the big cost driver. Okay. Um, Mario, could you go to the Matusla um, yeah. one? I just have a, an entertaining question about that. So, is that, you know, does Matusla stand for something or is he, I've heard that um, it may be related to the Bible or the guy who has lived for the longest was called Matusla. Is that, is that where he came from or? I think so, yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, it's the night, right? They managed to find uh, uh, nice words for, for each of them. I can even search it on the web. But clearly, yeah, Matusalem was this guy who was living uh, maybe 1,000 years. Now, if a particle lives 1,000 years, we'll never be able to detect it. But uh, it, uh, you know, it uh, lives few milliseconds. Maybe you can detect it with uh, Matusalem. Is it an acronym? That stands for oh, something. yeah, yeah, I can even search for that. If you want. Yeah, in fact, uh, Matusalem, uh, in French, for example, we say Matusalem for this uh, character, and in Greek, it's Matusala. So probably it's the, you know, the, okay. the reference so, to Matusalem. I found it. It's a massive uh, time, uh, massive time, timing, hodoscope for ultra-stable neutral particles. So they, they found a way to, to, you know, it's an acronym, they found a nice acronym for that. So now, and then you said that this has not been approved yet. Is he, is he likely to 
um, to uh, incur costs for CERN, or is he, the physic, physics case hasn't been... Well, you know, the big or? advantage of Matuzla is that it does not require any a new beam line or anything like this, because it just sits there. So if the universities are uh, able to find the money, then CERN cannot say no, or, well, <laughs> CERN cannot say much because they, they, they just need a you know, piece of land to, to put the detector. And the, 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 the neutrinos, the muons, or the particles, they would go there anyway. So that's a big advantage. On the other hand, uh, the fact that phaser is approved, that it's possible that, you know, at some point, uh, most of the community will uh, uh, converge into phaser. Uh, Mario, could you comment? Um, I don't know too much of this project, but uh, on the complementarity and maybe uh, differences in this project. For example, say phaser is approved. Uh, what can it do and what would we miss if we cannot do the other projects? Well, the point is that if you look at, uh, uh, no, where is it? Uh, um, yeah, these curves. Uh, this physics rich curves, uh, phaser uh, being a low intensity experiment respect to experiment as the SPS will have a smaller reach with respect to chip, for instance, because of the intensity. On the other hand, phaser may look at high energies because again, it's at the LHC. And okay. Matuzla is, uh, you know, is more or less here. So it, uh, it has smaller, must reach respect to ship uh, to higher coupling. So there is some complementarity, yes. Especially to the fact that the idea is very different. I mean, for, uh, for phaser, you are close to a high energy beam. For ship, you are close to, well, not so close, but say 100 meters from, uh, um, from a high intensity, lower energy beam. For Matuzla, you are far, from a low intensity, uh, high energy beam. Okay, I see. Okay. Does this on the top uh, right plot, does that look like the uh, coverage for Matusla is really ruled out by another experiment or will be Yeah, yeah, yeah but this is for the dark photon. So Matusla is not very good for dark photons, while in other, in other sectors like the heavy neutral leptons, so or oh, okay. uh, uh, scalars in this case, or these uh, uh, ALPs, coupling to fermions. Well, this is uh, uh, Medusa, for instance, is better than other. Okay, yeah, I see. Yeah. Okay, more questions? Um, if not, uh, I think it's time to uh, thank uh, Professor Mario Campanelli for this very nice lecture and this uh, nice discussion. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, uh, Ketevi has uh, recorded uh, the lecture. So uh, you can, if you're interested in this subject, you can come also come back to the slides, uh, which will be in Indico and also to the, to the recording of the lecture. Um, something is in the chat. Let me see. Okay, it was a, a thank. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Mario. Okay, nice thanks session. to you. It's been a pity that we're not all together in uh, Morocco, but okay, that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> and there was this link indeed from uh, Peter Jenny that uh, hopefully we will also maybe add uh, on the website potentially. But very interesting talk. Those two talks were very good. Thank you, Mario. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think now we will uh, call this, uh, this webinar uh, off. Thanks to all attending and thanks for the organization. Bye bye. Okay, bye bye. Bye. Bye, bye everybody. Bye bye.